year is 75 BC and you are the dominus of a house in the Roman city of Capua and the owner of a gladiator training school known as a Ludus. Your goal is to use political schemes and intrigue and win glorious battles on the blood-stained sands of the arena to become the most influential dominus in Capua. But beware, other ambitious men will seek to stop your rise to greatness and you must prepare yourself for the unexpected as you play Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. Hello everyone, this is Keith and welcome to my channel. Tonight on the Solo Gamers Club, I'll be teaching you to set up and play Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery by Gale Force 9 Studios. For this video, I'm using the 2012 version of the game, which features the artwork from the Star's television series of the same name. The game was re-released in 2021, but with the inclusion of artwork rather than the photos from the series. Likely this was due to licensing fees. I'll begin by showing you how to set up the game and then I'll provide an overview of the components and how they're used. Next, I'll provide an example of play using the standard rules. Finally, I'll outline the solo rules that I've developed for the game and I'll reset the game and provide an example of play using the solitaire system. So, strap on your sandals and sharpen your gladius as we learn to play Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. We begin with the game board. The game board serves as the grand arena where the bloody gladiatorial battles will be resolved. Wagers are placed on the outcome using the spaces provided at the corners of the board. House cards serve as the center of your play area and track your influence during the game. The cards detail each house's starting assets and asymmetrical special rules. Each card has a portrait and the name of the house. Along the top is the influence track. Depending upon the length of the game that you choose to play, we would start with either one influence, four influence, for a medium game or seven influence for a short game. The influence track is broken into four segments and as your influence rises your hand size will increase. Each house has specific starting assets and special rules that can be employed during the game. We place our slave cards to the left side of the display and our gladiators on the right hand side. If we have any guards we'll place them down below and if we have equipment we would also place that down below. Our card decks are divided into two types. We have a market deck and an intrigue deck. The market deck consists of three types of cards. Slave cards, gladiator cards, and equipment cards. Gladiators are exceptional slaves trained to fight in the arena and bring influence and glory to your house. Slaves are the servants of the Dominus, earning gold and performing other services. Slaves increase the wealth of the house. Equipment represents the arming and training of all of the house's gladiators in the use of specialized combat equipment. These are further divided into three types. We have weapons, armor, and special items. Only one card of each type may be used during each arena match. The Intrigue deck is divided into three types. We have Scheme cards, Reaction cards, and Guard cards. Scheme cards detail various types of underhanded maneuvers that can be played against your opponents. However, 
the House must possess a minimum required influence to enact them. Reaction cards are powerful countermeasures that can be played in response to events in the game. Some reactions are foils, which stop the schemes played by other houses. These also have a minimum required influence to enact. Then we have guard cards, which are a special type of reaction that can be used to stop schemes which target your house. Guards may be held in your hand or deployed to the table. The dice come in three colors. We have red, black, and blue. Red dice are attack dice and can damage an opponent. Black dice are defense and stop enemy red dice from wounding a gladiator. Finally, we have blue dice, which represent speed, and they dictate the movement ability of the gladiator in the arena and the gladiator's initiative. These combined values of attack, defense, and speed determine the health of the gladiator. Tokens include house tokens, gold, favor tokens, injury tokens, and champion tokens. The host token serves as the first player marker as well as announcing the host of the upcoming arena spectacle. Then we have gladiator figures which represent our chosen combatant in the arena and mark his position on the board. All right, we begin setup by placing the game board in the middle of the table. The game board features the arena area and some wagering spaces at the corners of the board. You'll notice in the arena area we have a Roman numeral one and Roman numeral two. Those correspond to these victory boxes one and two. So uh, when a battle is taking place in the arena, whether you have a gladiator involved or not, you're able to wager on that battle. And then you can either wager on gladiator one, gladiator two, if there was to be an injury in the game or a decapitation. Next, we're going to do our house selection. Each Dominus is going to roll a die and the highest die is going to take their choice of the house that they want to operate and they're going to receive the host token, which is uh, the first player marker. Now, I'm going to be setting this up for a three-player game. So we'll be making three dice rolls. The player positions one and two will be the uh, non-player houses. And then I'll be taking position three. So we'll make a dice roll for each of the houses, and then we'll see who would be. This is, oh, this is the standard setup of the game. Uh, there's a slightly different procedure when I get to my solitaire rules at the end of the video. But this is how you would do it for a standard game. So each house is going to roll. We'll roll for house one. He has a six. House two has a three. And house three has a four. Okay, so house one is going to select their house and they'll receive the host token. I placed a house token for each house in the bag, so I'm just going to randomly choose for the two other houses, and then I'm going to select my own, what's, what's left of those. First house is going to be the black player, and that's going to be House Glaber. Player number two is going to take on the reins of House Salonius. And for my house, I'm going to select House Batiatus. Each house will now collect their starting assets. We take a look at their house card, and it tells us the number of gladiators, the number of slaves, the number of guards, and their starting cash. The gold coins represent denarius. At the start of the game, we separate out these white bordered cards from the market deck. That's the starting gladiators and the starting slaves. Uh, so what we're going to do then is mix both of these decks up and then we're going to fulfill our starting assets using these two decks. Our starting cards 
will be three gladiators. We have a Gaul warrior, Thracian warrior, and a Syrian warrior. Our starting slave is an attendant, and we have two guards. We're also going to receive our influence token, which we'll set at four. We're going to be playing a medium, setting it up for a medium length game. And we also receive some additional markers that we will keep on the side here that we can use to mark our wagers during the arena battles. And then we place our starting gold in our treasury. House Badiatus will start with 10 gold. House Glaber begins with one starting gladiator, a Thracian warrior. You have two slaves, a convict and an attendant. And they'll begin with 10 gold. And we also select a model for that house. And that model will be used on the arena mat to display its position during the battle. House Glaber also begins with three guards and the host token. And finally, we have House Salonius. They're going to begin with two starting slaves, a convict and an attendant, two starting gladiators, a Thracian warrior and another Thracian warrior, one guard and 12 gold. Now we've selected a medium length game, so we've placed all everyone's tokens on space four. If we were to play a long game, it would be starting at one. And if we played a short game, it would be starting at seven. So we're going to be starting at four and the starting hand limit will be four cards. Now the decks are shuffled. We're going to shuffle the intrigue deck and the market deck. Now for the market deck, we're going to include those starting gladiators and starting slaves that we did not use during the setup and those are shuffled into the market deck so they might appear later in the game. And finally each house is given a turn summary card which relays the four basic steps of a round. The game is now set and we're ready to play. And once again the goal of the game is to raise our house to an impressive 12 influence and to maintain that 12 influence level till the end of any one of the four phases. The turn begins with the upkeep phase. Our first step is to refresh cards. If there were any cards that were turned over from the previous turn, we would flip those back to their active sides. Our next step is to heal injuries. If any of our starting gladiators here had injury markers on them, we'd make a D6 roll for each of the injured gladiators or slaves. And on a result of four plus, the injury is healed. On a result of two to three, his condition remains the same. But however, on a roll of a one, that character would die from his injuries and he'd be removed from the game. The last step of the upkeep phase is we have to balance our ledgers. Slaves, for each slave that we have in the house, earns us one denarius. Each gladiator costs us one denarius. So our income is one, we'll be paying out three, so we're at a deficit of two. So we have to pay two coins back to the bank for our support. So as you can see, it would be beneficial for the houses to be balanced in some degree and probably have a preference on more slaves than gladiators. And we'd have a constant source of income coming into the house. Here we have House Glaber. He has two starting slaves and one gladiator. So that's going to earn him one denarius of income. And finally, we have House Salonius. He has two slaves and two gladiators, so his ledgers are balanced. He'll neither gain nor lose denarius. Our next phase is the intrigue phase. And during that phase, we're going to draw intrigue cards. 
Each player will draw three cards. Now you'll notice that their influence marker tells you the hand size that they are going to have to abide by. Now that hand size limit does not have to be uh, rectified until the end of the intrigue phase. So if you have cards left over from the previous turn, you can keep all those, but your hand size must be adhered to at the close of the intrigue phase. So each house has drawn three intrigue cards. Each house will examine those intrigue cards and they'll develop a plot as to what to do with those cards. So we'll take a look at House Glaber's cards. He has a scheme, a guard card, and a reaction card. Now you'll notice at the bottom of the card they have a gold value in the lower left hand corner. These cards can be traded back into the bank for that value in gold if we choose to do that. Now the next consideration is at the upper left hand corner of the card. That is the influence minimum level that you need in order to utilize that card. Now all of these cards are level zero, so House Glaber will be able to play any of those. But occasionally you'll see cards in here with one, two, three, five, maybe even eight or twelve or more. And if you don't have that amount of influence, you won't be able to play the card. You're going to need support from another house in order to play that card. Now these cards can be played even on their owner's house. As an example, this labor contract. Target Dominus receives one gold per ready slave that they possess. Well, House Glaber would probably want to play that on himself. He has two ready slaves, so he'll play the card. He has the required influence to do it. The card would go into the discard pile, and he would receive one gold for each ready slave that he has. In this case, he has two. So House Glaber will be given two gold. The other card is a reaction card. Reaction cards can be played by that house to, for the effect that is listed. And this says it says play after a gladiator dies in the arena, plus one influence to the gladiator's dominus. He might want to play this on himself later in the turn if he ends up having a gladiator in the arena and it gets killed. Finally, you have a guard card, and House Glaber can either keep this in his hand to disguise it so that the other players would not see that he has a fourth guard, or he can decide to place it on the table and include it with his other guard cards, and I think that's what he'll do. That'll free up his hand a little bit. So right now, he has just one card remaining in his hand. Now, you'll notice that each house has some special rules here that they can use. Uh, he has Legionnaire Patrol. He can exhaust three guards and draw an entry card. He can do a Dispatch to Rome. Discard three guards to gain plus one influence. Well, it's a little early in the game for him to probably want to do that, but that's a very powerful option for House Glaber. I think what he will do is he'll exhaust the three guards and draw an entry card. So we're going to take three guards and we're going to turn those over. Those would be exhausted. That'll leave him with one guard that is still active. And he'll be able to draw an additional entry card. And we'll do that. And he gains a scheme. Word to the tax collector. Now this is going to require six influence in order to play. So he would need the help of another house in order to play that card. And that says... Target Dominus must pay bank five gold, or all their gold, whichever is left. Now House Glaber has a few options that he can do with this card. Now he needs some support. Now the support, you don't actually spend any of your influence. That stays where it is. You're just getting that player to agree to support you with whatever influence he has. So in this case, House Glaber has four. He needs at least two more influence in order to play the card. So he could approach, as an example, 
House Salonius. House Salonius has four influence. And he can say, hey, you know what? I have this um, scheme where I can send a word to the tax collector and we're going to nail House Batiatus and it's going to cost him five gold. Do you want to join me? And Salonius could would probably look at his intrigue cards and say, well, maybe that's not a bad idea. We'll do that. Uh, he also, looking at the treasury, he would House Glaber would say, well, Salonius has a lot of gold. He might approach House Batiatus and say, hey, I'm going to send a word to the tax collector. I need your assistance in this, and we can nail House Salonius. It's going to cost him five gold. There's also other ways to do this. You could He could drop a line to Batiatus and say, hey, I, you know, there's some word about tax collectors, and you might not have been paying all your taxes. Um, how much will you pay me to not... Uh, alert the tax collector and give you a problem. And so you can also do the negotiations that way and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll report Salonius, but you're gonna have to pay me two gold to do this. So there's many ways that this can be negotiated during the game. I think the most likely way for this to work would be Glaber to approach Batiatus and say, hey, there's tax collectors around, and I would hate for them to find out that you haven't been necessarily paying your fair share. So uh, I want you to not only give me your support, but pay me two gold, and I'm going to target Salonius, and he's going to be the one that's going to be the subject to these tax collectors. So I think that might happen. Batiatus would, rather than paying five gold, would probably rather give the two gold to Glaber. So he'll do that. He's going to give him two gold, and in addition, he's going to give him the support that he needs in order to play the card. So now he's going to play this card on House Salonius. So House Glaber throws the card at Salonius and says, Oh, you haven't been paying your taxes. Well, I've got the support of Badiatus, and we're sending word to the tax collector. So the target Dominus must pay the bank five gold, or all gold, whichever is less. So... Salonius has no choice. He'll have to pay the five gold. Now, obviously, this isn't going to make Salonius very happy with House Glaber. So when you do these things, you have to take it into account that you're kind of burning bridges in the process. So House Salonius has no choice. They're going to pay the five gold. Or he could make an agreement and say, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you three gold if you don't use that card. And that would be another option. So it depends on how severe House Glaber wants to be. Well, he's going to try to get Salonius. So Salonius is going to pay the five gold. That card is placed in the discard pile. And that would end that scheme. Now, incidentally, the only thing that can be traded at any time in the game is gold. You can't trade any cards or anything else. And you cannot trade entry cards at any time. You can sell them back to the bank for the value listed, but you can't trade these cards to other players. Everything else can eventually be traded between the houses. So I think that would end the intrigue phase for House Glaber, and we'll move on next in line would be House Salonius. So House Salonius is probably not too happy with House Glaber, so we'll take a look at his intrigue cards and see what he has. He ends up with two guard cards and a final blow. Now that was another option that Salonius could have done. He could have used either the guard card that he had in on the board or the two that he had, one of the two in his hand, to attempt to foil the scheme that was targeting him. Now in this case, having three guard cards, Salonius probably would use one of those in an attempt to foil that scheme with the tax collector. So what would have happened is Salonius would have said, well, I'm going to use one of my guards and I'm going to stop you from attempting this scheme against me. So he's going to roll a d6 and on a four to six, he would stop the scheme. Now this card is going to be used no matter what, whether he's successful in foiling it or not. So we'll make the roll. He rolled a four. So he would have used that guard card, and that would have stopped that entry card 
from being played against him. That guard card would be placed in the discard pile and then Salonius would be able to return the money that he lost. He wouldn't have to pay that money. So we'll give him back the five gold that he was going to lose to the tax collector. So he's going to regain that five gold. We'll do it that way. Now he has the option of either keeping these guard cards in his hand and kind of be secretive about this, or he can put a guard card out on the table and that would let the other players know that he has some ability to defend himself against schemes. Now he has one scheme card, it's called Final Blow. The target Dominus gains plus one influence. Now that is gonna require a total of 11 influence in order to play that card. He only has four. So more than likely, he's not gonna be able to get the 11 influence that he would need. So I think what would happen is Salonius will sell this card back to the bank for the two gold that is listed. So he's gonna gain the two gold. We'll add that to his treasury. Now he has some special rules here, bribes and pandering. He can pay X gold to reduce any schemes required influence by that amount. So as an example, when we had that 11 point card, he could have paid $7, seven gold, and reduce that requirement of the influence. And he could have played that card, but that would have cost him seven gold though. So that would have been kind of expensive. His other special rule is a finger in every pie. Discard one gladiator, one slave, and one guard to gain one influence. And I think he might think about doing that. It's a little early in the game though. So he only has the two starting slaves, two gladiators, and two guard cards in his hand right now. So I think what would happen here, more than likely Salonius would keep these guard cards in his hand. And he would hope that maybe House Batiatus would be playing some type of scheme against him and he'd be able to intercept that. He could also alert everyone and put one of the guard cards up and that might be a better play. And Batiatus would say, well, he's got a guard, so I'm not going to bother trying to target him. So those are, those are the different mechanisms and ways that we can play the game. I think that would end House Salonius's intrigue phase and we'd move on to House Badiatus. And we'll take a look at House Badiatus's intrigue cards. And he has a total of three schemes. He has Sate Roman Appetites, Robbery, and Epic Spectacle. Let's take a closer look at those cards. Now all of the cards have a influence cost of only zero, so he would be able to play all of these cards if he chooses to. Now one of these is the Epic Spectacle plus two influence to target Dominus with at least five ready gladiators. Well he doesn't have five, um, so that might be a card he might want to keep and play that on himself. Or he could uh, turn that card back into the bank and gain two, two gold. He has another card, you may uh, robbery, you may take up to three gold from a target Dominus. That might be a card he might want to think about playing. Then he has Sate Roman Appetites, plus one influence to target Dominus with at least four ready gladiators. So if he can pick up an extra gladiator, he'd be able to play that card on himself. I think the most likely thing would be for House Badiatus to sell this card back to the bank for two gold. So we'll do that. So that'll earn him two gold. And now he's got to decide if he wants to maybe use this robbery card. You may take up to three gold from a target Dominus. It has no value, so he might as well attempt to play it. Now he's got to select a target. Now he already gave support to Glaber in the playing of that card against Salonius. So he might want to maybe make friends with Salonius a little bit. You don't want to burn all your bridges early in the game. So I think what he'll do is he's going to play this robbery card against House Glaber. So he is going to throw this card in front of House Glaber and say, robbery, you may take up to three gold from the target Dominus. And Glaber is going to probably try to play his guard card 
to try to stop that. So he's going to make a roll and see if he can stop this robbery by using his guards. Here's the roll. The roll is a two, so he's failed. The guard card is discarded and the effects of the scheme will take place. And that means that Badiatis is going to take three gold from House Glaber. And then that robbery card is put to the discard. Now House Badiatis has some special rules here. He has exhibition match. He can exhaust two gladiators to gain two gold. And I think he might do that. Uh, so more than likely he would exhaust two of his gladiators. They'll still leave him one if he has to, if he's invited to participate in the arena. And that's going to earn him two gold. So he'll gain two more gold from the bank. And I think that would probably bring his turn to a close. The other option is for him to just sell this card back to the bank and try to collect the other two gold that it's worth. He would have to have four ready gladiators in order to play that card. That would give him one influence. So if during the market phase he was able to purchase a gladiator, that card would be valid. So I think he'll just hang on to that card for right now. And that's going to bring the intrigue phase to a close and we'll move on to the market phase. Now the market phase has three steps. First step is the open market. Players are free to buy, sell, and trade assets which, with each other and the bank. This will be not the sale, selling of entry cards, but the sale of gladiators, slaves, guards, weapons, whatever you have can be negotiated. And you can approach a, another house and say, hey, I'd like to purchase one of your two slaves that you have. He might approach, Badiatis might approach Salonius and say, I'd be, uh, like to purchase one of your gladiators and I'll give you five gold for that gladiator. And Salonius says, well, it has a face value of two and uh, maybe I'll do that. So that's how this uh, open market portion of the market phase would work. Badiatis knows that he has that card that if he can have at least four ready gladiators, he'd be able to earn one influence and the influence is everything in this game. So he might negotiate something like that. Now this early in the game, with Badiatis already having three gladiators, I don't know that Salonius might want to sell, but that's how this would work. Next step would be the auction phase. And what'll happen there is we're gonna deal three cards from the market deck face down. And then they're gonna be revealed one at a time, and then all the players will bid on that market card. And we lay down a number of market cards equal to the number of players. In this case, we have a three player game. So we would lay out three market cards face down on the table. Now during this auction phase, this is gonna be done with concealed bidding. What'll happen is each of the houses will take all of the gold that they have and place it in their hand. A card, the market card will be revealed. In this case, we have Prisia. She is a slave. Now she has ability to be placed into a gladiatorial match. She's worth three gold and she has a special skill called um, Intrigue, which can be exhausted to gain one gold. So it's pretty valuable. So what'll happen is each house, based upon their money that they have in their treasury, and with the knowledge that two other market cards are going to be coming out, we'll place a bid on Prisia. Now House Badiatis, right now, his ledger is at minus two. He has one slave with three gladiators. So he would probably like to get another slave and she would also offer ability to gain some gold. So I think Badiatis would probably wager, I think five. So he'll take five gold coins in his hand and then he would just put his hand out with the gold coins in there and then wait for the other two houses to do the same. 
So for the time being, I'll just place these five gold coins for Badiatis off to the side. And then we would decide what is Salonius going to do. Salonius has an abundance of coins in his treasury, so he decides, without knowing what Badiatis has done, he feels that Prisia is worth six. So he places six gold in his hand and holds it out. We'll place those off to the side of the board for Salonius. And finally, House Glaber. Now, House Glaber already has two starting slaves, which is earning him plus one income. And he can decide whether he wants to spend um, money on more slaves, but he only has one gladiator, so he has to kind of think about that. And I think what he would do is he might say, well, I'm only going to bid three on this, and we'll see if maybe I can pick it up in a tie or something. So he puts three in his hand and puts it out. Then once all the bids are in, everybody is revealed, and then the card will go to the highest bidder. In this case, Halcelonius bid six. So he is going to get Prisia for six gold. That gold will go to the bank. And the other gold that was bid by Badiatis and Glaber will go back to their treasuries. They didn't spend it. Now, say, for example, one or more of the houses tied in the amount that they bid for Prisia. What will happen is each of the two houses, like, say, for instance, if Glaber and Salonius both bid six, their money would be put on the board and they would make an additional bid for Prisia. They would do the same procedure, putting however many extra gold that they want in their hands. Those would be put out and then revealed. And Prisia would go to the side that has the most gold, including the extra amount that was bid. Prisia would go to that house. Now, if they're still tied, they would do that again. And that gold that was put down would be added to the totals and then an additional gold would be revealed and eventually you would get to a point where one of the two houses would outbid the other. If they don't, after a few rounds, then this card is just simply discarded and no one will get the card. Then the next market card would be revealed. In this case it is a gladiator named Dagon. Now he has an attack of three, defense of four, three speed. He's worth three gold. He has a special ability, hardened. Defense triples block all attacks. All right, so he's a pretty, pretty good gladiator. Now, obviously, Badiatis would love to get him, uh, and that would allow him to play that scheme card, Sate Roman Appetites. So he would, doing that, he would probably put a fairly large wager in on Dagon. And we'll say that he decides to wager eight. So he's going to put eight gold tokens in his hand and put it out. Then we would move on to Salonius. Now Salonius has two gladiators, and he doesn't have quite as much money as he did before. So I think he would probably try to put a bid in of maybe six. There's still another market card out there, so you don't want to go too much because you won't have enough to purchase something that you might really want. So Salonius will put six in his hand, and that would be his secret wager for Dagon. And finally, we have House Glaber. And well, Glaber could use another gladiator. He only has one. So we'll say that uh, House Glaber would put in eight. So he has eight in his hand, and it's revealed, and we've got a tie. Eight to eight. House Salonius is out of the bidding, so he gets his money back. But the other two houses now have to decide if they want to put an extra bid in for Dagon. Now the houses have the option of not putting any extra bid in. They can do that. Or they can put one, two, three, or as many as they have in an attempt to secure Dagon. I think House Badiatis would probably put an additional three in. 
House Glaber is getting a little thin on funds. So I think he would only put in an extra two. They're revealed, and we find out now that House Badiatis has a total of 11. House Glaber has a total of 10. So House Glaber is out of the bidding. Dagan will go to House Badiatis, and all of the coins will go into the bank. And so House Badiatis will add Dagan to his Ludus. And then we'll reveal the last market card. And this time it is a slave. It's a starting slave. He's a deserter. He has no special ability. He has a value of two and only ones if he was to be put into the arena. Well, House Badiatis has spent most of his money. He's only got two gold left. So he probably wouldn't bid on this starting slave. So we'll see what will happen with Salonius and with Glaber. Now Glaber has all of this money back, so he's got more to spend. And I think what would happen, more than likely Salonius would probably bid, say, three. And Glaber probably would bid, we'll say, four. And Glaber is going to take that starting slave for four. The three will be returned to Salonius. The four from Glaber will go into the bank. And Glaber will add the deserter slave to his house. And now we move on to the last step of the market phase, and that is bid for hosting. Everyone is going to put in a concealed bid to gain the host token. Now, House Badiatis only has two, so he probably wouldn't even bother putting in a bid. House Salonius has eight. So I think he might put a bid of five in. So he'll put five to getting that host token. And finally, House Glaber, he currently has the host token, so for him to keep it, he would have to spend or bid to keep it. So I think Glaber would probably bid four, we'll say. So he's gonna bid four. He's outbid by Salonius, so Salonius is going to pay the five and he's going to gain that host token and he'll be the first player and he'll also be in charge of the arena for the coming arena phase. So we move on to the arena phase and what we do there is we begin with the honor to the host step. Whoever is going to be hosting the arena gains plus one influence. That's why that host token is so valuable because it gives you not only you are the first player, but you get a, a lot of bonuses in this arena phase. So he's going to gain one influence. He's up to five now. Next up is the hosting the event step. The host will invite two players to the game. Now the host can invite himself if he chooses to. Now looking at the available gladiators that are out on the board, he sees that House Batiatis has Dagon, so he doesn't want to necessarily invite Batiatis. So I think what he'll do, seeing that House Glaber has just one gladiator, I think he will invite Glaber, and he's going to invite himself. Now, if you're invited to the games and you choose not to participate for whatever reason, you lose one influence, so it's never a good idea to refuse that invitation. Now being the host gives you a lot of flexibility. You could see possibly that a house has no gladiators or any slaves as an example. So they wouldn't be able to put up someone to the arena. So you could purposely select them and force them to take the minus one to influence. So that host token has a lot of benefits. Uh, the next step is tribute. Players are paid for any favor or champion tokens on their combatants. Now what happens with that is as a gladiator wins contests, he receives favor. So as an example, we'll say that Salonius's Thracian warrior won 
a, a previous battle in the arena, he would have a favor token on him. Now, when you get three favor tokens, that gets turned into a champion token. That makes that gladiator very popular amongst the crowds at the arena. Each favor token that would be on a gladiator uh, produces two gold for his owner. For each champion that he has in his possession, he earns six gold. So it's very important to when you're building your stock of gladiators that you definitely want to keep uh, keep these gladiators alive. You don't want to waste a, an experienced gladiator in a conflict that he might be likely to lose. And incidentally, this tribute is only paid if that gladiator is going to be sent into the arena. So after an invitation is accepted, each team has to put forward a gladiator of their choice. Glaber only has one, so he's going to put forth his Thracian warrior. Salonius has two starting gladiators, both Thracian warriors. They both have the same statistics, three attack, two defense, and two speed. So it won't matter which one he'll put forward. I think he'll put this one forward. And those will be the two gladiators that we're going to be seeing in the arena. Glaber will put his starting gladiator on space one. Salonius is the host, and he'll place his gladiator on space two. And then we'll place these cards next to each of their gladiators. Now at this time, if we had any equipment you'd be able to assign it to that gladiator to increase their chances in the arena. Neither of the houses have any equipment. Now, all houses can wager on the combat. The choices are victory for player one, victory for player two. You can wager that there will be an injury or you can wager that there will be a decapitation. Now a house cannot bet against its own gladiator, so if they do choose to bet on victory, they have to, they have to support their own gladiator. Other houses that aren't even involved in this can also wager as well. So Batiatis could wager on this if he chose. And House Batiatis is gonna place a small wager. He's gonna place a wager one gold on victory for player one. So what we do is we put down his wager and then we also put down his house symbol on top of the wager. If gladiator one wins, he'll be paid one to one. Maximum wager is always three. Salonius is gonna wager on his own gladiator. He'll put down a wager of one with his symbol. And finally we have Glaber, he's going to wager three on his. And that'll be for gladiator number two. So the wagers are complete now. You'll find out that wagering on decapitation is a big risk. Generally, in order to get a decapitation, you need to have a, a gladiator involved that has a very high attack value. Uh, otherwise, decapitations are very unlikely. The next step of the phase is the combat. We begin by rolling the speed value of each of the gladiators. And the high score will have the initiative. And then they can either choose to go first or go second. And just so we can keep everything straight, I'm going to place a house marker on each of the gladiators so that we can know whose is whose. All right, and we'll begin with the initiative and we'll start with House Glaber's gladiator. He has a speed of two, he'll roll two dice. And he rolls a total of four, so we'll put that result on the board. And now House Salonis 
is going to roll two dice. That's the speed of his gladiator. And he rolled a two. So House Glaber has the initiative and he can decide if he wants to move first or second. And I think House Glaber will move first and he's going to charge right at his opponent. Now you can move on the map the speed of whatever your speed value is, that number of hexes. So he has a speed of two. He'll move two spaces directly towards his opponent. All right, now during your turn, you can either move and attack or attack and move. Those are your options. In order to do a standard attack, you have to be adjacent to your target, unless you have some kind of ranged weapon, a javelin or a trident. But with standard weapons, you have to be next to that character. Now the gladiator for House Salonius can take his actions, and he's going to do his move first, and he's going to move straight at his opponent. One space between them, neither of them can launch an attack, and that ends that combat round, and we start a new round. Same procedure, rolling for initiative, and then that Gladiator can decide to go first or second. So we'll roll the initiative for House Glaber. He rolls a seven. And the initiative for House Salonius is a six. So House Glaber has the initiative and this will be an important to, it's important to gain that initiative because uh, the first strike in this game is very important. So House Glaber is going to move. He has a movement of two, one and two. And he's going to attack that opponent. So what will happen is the attacker will roll a number of attack dice. Those are the red dice equal to his current attack level, which is three. House Salonius is defending. He has a defense of two. He'll be rolling two black dice. And what will happen is we're going to roll these dice and they'll be aligned from highest to lowest and compared. And that will determine whether there's any wounds issued from that attack. So we'll roll these and see what happens. All right, there is our results. We line these results up. The attacking dice versus the defending dice. And it's not good for Salonius. House Glaber wins six to two. He also wins four to one. Now this third dice is unopposed. And if it's unopposed by defense, if the result is a one or two, nothing happens. However, if it's a three or greater, an additional wound would be laid out. Now, to issue the wounds, we take all of his totals. He has three attack, two defense, and two speed. Now, he has to take two wounds, so he has to lose two, two dice of any type that he chooses. You can't lose, you have to leave one of each color until it's the last set of wounds that you take. So, in this case, he can lose perhaps a speed and maybe a defense, or he could lose a attack and a speed, and that would cover two wounds that he has to uh, sustain. And I think in this case, he's going to surrender a speed and a defense die. Let's go back into the supply, and these dice will remain out, and Dice for House Glaber will remain out. And that right now is the overall health of the characters. House Glaber has a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 health. House Salonius has a health of 5. Now it would be House Salonius's gladiator's turn to either attack and move or move an attack. Well, in this case, he's going to launch an attack first. So he's going to roll all of his attack dice, and House Glaber will roll his defense dice. And we'll see what happens. Okay, here is the roll. All 
All right, those dice will be laid out as we did previously. A five, a four, and a two versus a six and a three. So we analyze those results. The six is enough to stop that five attack, so that is been parried. However, four beats the three, so there's one wound there. It'll be going on to House Glaber's Gladiator. Then there's an unopposed die, but again, now this is less than three, so that won't count. So he has to do what he's done one wound to the opponent, and I think that opponent is going to take out a speed die. So now the dice are returned. And we're going to start another round. Now, House Salonius could technically move. His speed is a one. That would allow him to pull back one away from that character. And I guess he'll do that. And we'll begin a new round, and each side is going to roll a blue dice. This will be for House Glaber. Rolls a one. And House Salonius rolls a four. So how Salonius has the advantage. And he is going to move and attack. So he'll move back in and attack. How Salonius has three attack dice. House Glaber has two defense and we'll roll those. Right. Results are a six, four, and one versus a six and a one. Now, if the dice are tied, if there are no equipment that allows you to win ties, it goes to the defender. So in this case, that's no hit. Here, the four beats the one, so the attacker does one point of damage to the defender. The unopposed die is less than three, that won't count. So one point of damage has to be applied to House Glaber. And I think he's going to have to take... He'll take one of his defense dice. That'll be lost. So the attack dice will go back to House Salonius, and the defense dice will go back to House Glaber, and we're ready for another round. Or I should say we're ready for House Glaber's portion of the turn. All right, I think he's going to stay where he is, and he's going to launch an attack on House Salonius. So it'll be three attack dice against one defense dice. Okay, and here is the roll. And the results are a four, three, and one versus a five. So he's able to parry one of them. We've got two unopposed dice. One of them is less than three, it won't count, but this one will count. So he's done two wounds to his opponent. And he really has no option other than to take two attack dice as his damage. So he's down to three dice. Now we're ready to start a new round. It's not looking good for Salonius. So we will roll for initiative. This will be for House Salonius. Rolls a two. And House Glaber rolls a five, and he has the initiative. So House Glaber has the initiative, and he's going to attack. He will attack with three attack dice against one defense for Salonius. Here's the roll. Oh my goodness. An absolute fantastic attack by House Glaber. He's got three sixes. So what is going to happen, that will be a successful attack, an unopposed six successful attack, and another unopposed six successful attack. He's done a total of three hits to House Salonius, and that is going to take all of his dice, and he is decapitated. House Glaber has won by decapitation. So that gladiator is defeated 
and House Glaber is the victor. The winning house is going to gain plus one to influence. That means House Glaber will move up from four to five. And now the wagers will be dealt with. House one was defeated. So both of these wagers are put back to the bank and the, their tokens are returned to the various houses. House Glaber was victorious. He'll earn one to one, so he'll not only receive his original wager of three, he also gets three more for the victory. He's got a total of six gold there. That's outstanding for House Glaber. Now the losing gladiator was decapitated. He is removed from the game. The victorious gladiator from House Glaber is going to earn a favor token. We'll place the favor token on him and that gives him a little notoriety with the patrons of the arena. And that gladiator is returned to the Ludus of House Glaber. And that completes a full round of Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. Now I'm going to uh, reset the game and I'm going to discuss my fledgling solo rules that I've developed to try to play this game solitaire. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying this is a multiplayer game. It's impossible to play this solitaire and you may be correct. But I did develop some rules and I'm going to see if there's a way I can tweak this to be able to still make it an enjoyable playthrough for a sol solitaire player. Now granted this game is structured for the multiplayer interactions that would occur but I think it could still be fun to be played solitaire if you're waiting for your friends to come over and maybe it's they're coming next week and you still say well I might want to play Spartacus and I think we'll see how these rules work out. These are in its their infancy and uh, this is a first draft but I'll show you what I have. Okay, as for the solitaire rules, the setup will remain pretty much the same. We're going to randomly determine any non-player houses, and then we'll decide by high roll who has the host token to start the game. The upkeep phase will remain unchanged. Those would be handled exactly as we have for the standard rules. As for the intrigue phase, the phase will play much like in the standard game, but we're going to have to make obviously modifications because we have non-human players involved. So what will happen is, number one, cards of the non-player houses are kept face down until a game action requires them to be examined. When a non-player house begins their intrigue phase, their cards are flipped face up. Reaction cards that have an influence cost greater than the house's current influence would be sold back to the bank. Guards would always be deployed on the table. And then a scheme would be played. If the scheme requires support, that house would have to roll on the support table. The support table is used when we need to gain support from a non-player house or a non-player house requesting support from a, another non-player house or a player house. And it's basically a 2d6 roll. Between 2 and 7, the support would be denied. On an 8 to 12, support is given. And we have some modifiers down below. Minus 1 for each unfriendly token on the targeted house when a player-controlled house requests support. In order to kind of gauge the feeling of the houses to the player character, I had to create some tokens. And they're basically plus and minus tokens. And I'll talk more about those in a second. Uh, the other modifiers would be minus one when requesting support from an additional house for the same scheme. So if you need to get more support than one house, the second roll would be at a minus one making it more difficult. Another modifier would be minus one if the requesting house has the highest influence. That'll make it more difficult. 
and plus one for each friendly token used as a DRM. And we'll, now we'll talk about those. Okay, friendly and unfriendly tokens. These tokens are placed on non-human houses only to chart the relationship between the human-controlled house and its non-human counterparts. These tokens provide dice roll modifiers when a human-controlled house attempts to seek their support. When a player-controlled house successfully plays a scheme against a non-player house or does not honor an agreement, we would add an unfriendly token. That's the minus sign, and that's in red. A human-controlled house may gain friendly tokens with an opposing house by giving gold to that faction and using the persuasion table to determine the effect of the gift. So as an example, say I wanted to uh, gain favor with House Gl Glaber, I would make a donation to him, and we'll say I gave him three gold. Well, we would make a roll on that table for three gold. And that would determine how many positive markers I'd be able to put on his house card. Now, this only refers to the relationship between the human player and the non-human house. Each plus cancels out a minus. So, in this case, say we were to give him three gold, we'd roll the dice. We roll the six. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a 2d6. We'll roll another one. Result is a nine, so nine with three gold. We would gain one positive friendly token and place that on House Glaber. Then these can be used to modify other dice rolls when we're attempting to try to influence that house. I realize this is kind of uh, convoluted, but it's the only way you can I, that I can come up with where you could kind of keep some record of your. Uh, interactions with that house and have like a memory to it so to speak so each time you'd go after glabber there with a scheme card he would gain a minus token and you can attempt to mitigate those by trying to purchase on the persuasion table with gold trying to get these plus tokens and those would cancel out plus cancels out the minus and that's kind of how what i'm what i've come up with at least initially for this now when it's time for a non-player house to play a scheme uh, we would make a 2d6 roll and roll on the table, and this will tell us which house he's going to target, either the house with the highest influence, second highest, third highest, or lowest influence. And uh, to determine the influence of a human-controlled house, we would add one point to its existing influence for each unfriendly token. So that would increase the chances of uh, that the human house being targeted by this guy. So say for an example, we had kind of shafted him a few times during the play of the game with schemes, and there were two uh, unfriendly tokens on his chart. When we make the roll on the table and we determine who has the highest influence, I would take my normal influence, and in this case, we would be adding one for each of those, making my chances of being the target of the scheme greater. Then a way to handle the bidding process in the game, I've come up with a non-player bid chart. And basically what we would do when this was part of the um, market phase where we have auctions, we would be able to randomly determine what, how many coins that the non-player houses are going to bid uh, for a particular market card. And I've got some modifiers on here. Minus one if the house already has a similar equipment asset. Plus one if the house does not have a similar equipment asset. Plus two if it is a gladiator and the house has none. And plus two if it's a slave and the house has none. So that would make their bids larger in an attempt to acquire those market cards. Now obviously the human player would make any of his bids first. And then we would make the rolls for the other houses and determine who gets the card. This is, like I said, this all of this is uh, in flux right now. I'm just, this is my initial offering to see, and I'm going to try to play this out and see how it, how it works, and then if necessary, make adjustments. But that was my first uh, idea on how to handle the bidding aspects of, um, of the game. And then when it comes time to bid for the host, uh, during that step, the human control player would make his bid first, and then each non-human house would make a roll 
on the bid for hosting table and we would basically have these columns divided by the amount of gold that they have currently in their treasury. So as an example, if House Glaber had 16 gold in his treasury, we would make a 2d6 roll and determine what his bid is for hosting the arena. He rolled a 6, so a 6 with 16, he would be putting 5 towards that bid. So I think this is probably going to be have to be uh, modified, but after I play through this a few times, I'll see how this reacts with um, uh, the human player in a, in a real game. There's some modifiers also, plus one if the house is not the most influential, and plus one if the house has three or more available gladiators, so they would be more willing to want to participate. And we'll just see how this works out. And um, no guarantees on this. I, I know this is a... Uh, large undertaking to attempt to simulate uh, human players with dice rolls, but this might be a way that uh, it could still be fun to play the game reasonably with not too many changes to the original rules. And then when it comes to the arena phase, the host will always invite the house with the weakest gladiator gladiators measured by total health. The host will always invite themselves if they've got a greater than 50% chance of victory, and a host will never invite the house with the most influence unless the influence leader has no available gladiators and you'd be forcing him to uh, either put up a slave or to lose influence. So that's kind of what I've got so far. The only significant change to the rules as written uh, would be the open market portion of the market phase. That I'm, I would just, uh, I'm leaning towards canceling that and not allowing any open transfer. That would be too hard, I think, to simulate. But I think with the closed bidding of the auction phase, we could probably simulate uh, based upon what type of market card it is and the types of cards that that house already has. You could probably estimate like what they might offer to pay for a specific market card. At least it would simulate it somewhat close. And that's kind of the premise that I'm going with for this, for these solo rules. So if I'm able to make any progress on this, I will post my solitaire rules on BGG in the Spartacus page. But I think these have to be definitely tested out more and I'm gonna to have to probably make some changes to it. And uh, we'll just, we'll see if this is a viable thing to do. I know it's a, quite a undertaking to try to simulate something like this, but you still might be able to make the game somewhat solo friendly and, uh, you know, still kind of uh, enjoy the theme that the developers have created. So that's going to bring this video to a close, and I hope the viewers enjoyed this preview of Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. I'll uh, keep the viewers advised if I make any progress on the solitaire rules, and if I do, I'll produce a uh, short video outlining the changes, and I would post these on BGG. So in the meantime, thanks for watching. I appreciate your views and your likes. And until next time, this is Keith from the Solo Gamers Club signing off and inviting you to tune back again next time for a new video. Thanks to everyone and have a good night.